Thank you for joining us everyone. Uh, my name is Nelson Cummins. Uh, I'm the Communities and Campaigns Officer at the Coalition for Racial Equality and Rights, CRER. Uh, we're an anti-racist charity based here in Glasgow um, and we've coordinated a programme of events for Black History Month in the UK, uh, which takes part every October um, for the past 20 years. And a lot of our work in this area is rooted in anti-racism and campaigning work to make sure that black history is recognised as Scotland's history. Um, and we've got a wonderful event this evening that is taking place as part of um, a programme of events for US Black History Month uh, that has been organised by ASLA, who are the Association uh, for African American, for the Study of African American Life and History. Uh, and I can't thank them enough for their help and support with organising this event and for giving us this platform. And I particularly want to give thanks uh, to Gloria Brown Marshall and all the other members of the International Committee uh, for their help and support in putting this event together. Um, and so for the event today, we have a selection of speakers who I'll hand over to very shortly. Uh, they're going to discuss issues of racism and public health in Scotland. Um, and as I said earlier, I'll be watching the chat box throughout. So if you have any questions during, feel free to put them in the chat and hopefully we'll have some time to discuss them after what I'm sure will be three very excellent presentations. Um, so our first speaker this evening, this evening is Ema Jackson. Uh, so I'll just give you a bit of intro about her, info about her before handing over to her. Uh, so Dr. Ema Jackson is a community engaged researcher who works broadly within migration and with those from marginalized and racialized ethnic groups. She works regularly across portfolios with Scottish government ministers, their civil servants and policymakers. Over the last 20 years, as unprecedented migration has changed Scotland's demographic, her work has built from the experiences of those who are often marginalized and racialized within our systems. Uh, her work is based in social justice and disrupts usual process within, um, sorry, I just lost my notes there, uh, disrupts usual, process within policy and her work informs policy and service provision both nationally and internationally. Um, so Ema, after you. Okay, thanks Ema. Nelson, thanks Gloria, and very nice to have this opportunity to talk a little bit about just both my work but also the work that's going on um, in Scotland in relation to, to um, well, we'll call it racialized um, health inequalities. Um, I am going to talk, this is very much geared, I guess, towards an American audience. Um, so I'm going to talk just a little bit first about um, our, the way that I work, not as an example, not as a, because I really want everyone to focus about the way that I work, but the way that I work is a reflection of some of the issues that we have to face when we are trying to bring to attention the experience of people who are racialized. I'm going to talk a little bit about country of, of Scotland and about its history. And then I'm going to talk about how I ended up leading um, a sort of piece of work at the start of COVID, um, which was the COVID and expert group um, on ethnicity, which was a key kind of, has become a key kind of driver about looking at racialized health inequalities in Scotland. So I'll just make a start. Um, as an academic, I mostly work towards policy and service provision, um, not perhaps in the more usual channels within uh, the academy. And I did that a long time ago where the power, because I recognized where the power in Scotland is to address societal change in our processes and very much therefore wanted to fo focus on sort of policy and service provision. So Scotland, a small country with a long history of emigration, not immigration, and we really struggle to engage with that history, that emigrant history, and I will talk a bit about that later. Um, so within Scotland, there have been people from a minority of backgrounds for a very long time. 
Um, the last census, which was 2011, put it at about 4% of the population, but everybody knows that that's, we've had unprecedented, like we haven't got our new census until this year, but that, um, that those numbers have greatly increased. And actually Glasgow, which is where I live in, in the west of the country, is projected to have about a fifth of our population from a minority ethnic background from 2030. So basically the demographic change, which has already happened in Scotland, has really been unprecedented and our systems are really struggling to engage with that reality. So basically the ways of institutional organizing, organizational racialized inequality that has impacted for generations is now impacting on greater amounts of people. And that is becoming clearer and clearer and more uncomfortable for the system to ignore. This was particularly made clearer within the onset of COVID as the reality of disproportionate increased morbidity and mortality made it clear of the social, historical, economic impacts of inequity that were manifesting in ways which was such a clear way that it was it's absolutely staggering even to the dominant white population. It was four times, and this is UK wide, and I'll talk a wee bit more about Scottish data, but it was four times more likely for black males and twice as likely for the Asian people from Asian population and to die of COVID um, at the start. And I'm gonna come back and just talk a little bit more about that. But for, before I do, I'm gonna talk about my actual work working within the academy, working with policy, because I think that might be of interest to the sort of uh, audience of how um, we have to navigate as black academics, the system that surrounds us. So I very much worked for years, really quite isolated. I became influenced by uh, Crenshaw, Kimberly Crenshaw, Bell Hooks, Patricia Hell Collins, who really kind of helped me to remain confident in the decisions that I took many years ago to grind myself with the communities, with the peoples racialized in order to understand how the systems, particularly of health, but, but wider operates around them. And that was really a, a good decision. And what I focused on as an academic was, was what happened was the focus with the communities to work out how the systems function, what sorts of evidence is valued or seen of value. Um, and I did that by focusing my attention on the academy itself through building relationships with communities with those say from African or Asian descent, people who've migrated or families who've migrated generationally, basic people who've been racialized and marginalized. And I started spending time with them <laughs> 20 years ago working out about their experiences of the research landscape and the service provision and the barriers, and most importantly, what they saw as the solutions to what they experience. So I've run several, like, and I run <laughs> several um, projects in relation to this. I actually do, and it was mentioned just by Nelson at the start, work cross sector because the experiences obviously in that, in, that result in health inequalities are not just created within the sort of a, a short, a small framing of or sort of, uh, of health. It's much wider. It's about um, our economic position, about our education systems, about the justice system, and so all these systems. So and and I would argue the cultural sector too. And so really my work works right across. And so I'd be as likely to be doing some work in the cultural sector as I would be doing into the um, health sector. So um, my work kind of focuses on how issues to do with those racialized get framed by researchers, by get framed by service provision, get framed by, policy makers and that how that then creates a sort of series of events from that which in my view often end uh, not really tackling the actual issues for those who are racialized 
So in doing that way of working, I find I actually had to move away from the equalities landscape itself, where often this research actually can be funded and undertaken because of the way that the experiences of people who are racialized are framed and understood has deep assumptions about how the problems for those racialized should become investigated and that how that then gets translated is problematic. So basically, we are often founded in Scotland to time and time again to do the same sort of research over and over again, proving that the inequity and how it manifests, but the systemic issues and the implementation of what was proposed in those in, in research or proposed by um, communities arguing for a different perspective and whether anything that was implemented was effective or not is very rarely researched and looked, uh, looked at. So I think I kind of grew confidence about this type of um, ways of engagement, um, reputation and authority as an academic has certainly grown over the years. And I think some of the work that we've seen, systemic work that's gone on, particularly since the impact of COVID has become clearer, has supported this kind of approach what I would call a community engaged approach to research and to understanding the mechanisms of which we can bring in the representation of those racialized and marginalized into the research, into the policy and into the practice making um, decision for us. So the key issue, I guess, within that is that I've always believed that it's um, the understanding of their own experiences within a system which adversely racializes them is the evidence which the academy actually needs to understand in order to reduce the well-known inequalities within research evidences. So, oops, <laughs> I think you won't necessarily know this, particularly in America, but this happened at a sort of a large scale in, within the pandemic when we were looking at racialized inequalities that were beginning to be shown from the morbidity and mortality rates um, that research then that was funded to look at this involved no black researchers um, at all. And the main body, the UKRI, the research reinnovation was called out really by um, 10 women uh, academics, who, black academics who wrote an, op uh, an open letter highlighting the, the much greater need for transparency, accountability, inclusion. So I think that that kind of example uh, is a really clear, helpful example of how um, the issues which surround the systemic issues, which is what my work is about, frame issues of health inequality have got such deep problems around them for in order before we can even begin with some of dealing with some of the inequalities that people experience, it's actually looking at the system of which um, holds the evidence and makes the decisions. Um, so within that knowledge, I have been taking forward work within um, Scottish government in order to do that. Just sorry, there's just one sort of last bit related to that is that the marginalization, the sort of marginalization of black academics, how bias and research funding might shape knowledge equity and what is research, the basic lo uh, lack of knowledge about race science, the conflation of ideas about biological race and ethnicity in our health research and our safeguarding processes and the harms that these that re reproduces are not often considered even in our research ethical processes, not to mention um, the discriminatory research culture that impacts upon the experience and career progression of black researchers and academics within higher education and research. So learning to all sort of to understand all this in which in order to work within the public health landscape, I know is very, will be very familiar to many in the US. So, obviously working in this way kind of comes at cost but I knew that if quite early on that if I problematize the racialized people's experience and engage 
my research lens along the dominant thinking which centers a white perspective of the issues, I could be rewarded by the system. And many are not necessarily able to take a route like me. Many choose to leave or not engage because it's not for safe professionally nor particularly rewarding. But I think a bit of a change is happening and behind kind of all the media storm and, 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 and sort of what's been going on uh, internationally and internationally and sort of been sort of focused on ideas related to sort of decolonizing the academy, decolonizing the curriculum, development of anti-racist approach, approaches, the expression and understanding, increased understanding of inequalities, which was clearly highlighted for society about how COVID has manifested in our society through Black Lives Matter and through uh, movement and many others is creating a bit of a moment. So I'm just gonna talk a wee bit, I'm gonna put the historical context about Scotland um, and its engagement with this. So Scotland is an interesting place to work within this landscape. Um, I think a key issue right now is about Scotland's relationship to the transatlantic slave trade. Um, and from my perspective, it is in such an important moment. And this moment is impacting right into our understanding about health and about public health and the sort of social and political moment where um, we have a government which actually wants to frame itself as a modern progressive country, which is dealing with its history. So we're kind of working in a context, I think brought to the fore with, um, in society, where we, within the COVID, we were sort of made clear the, or clearer, the history and the understanding of how racialization happens in society, how racism functions, and really the, the within that, the legacies of empire, of, uh, colonialism and Scotland for such a small country was di disproportionately integral to the transatlantic slave trade, the spread and have harms in empire colonialism and subsequently has been in disproportionately integral to the devastating impacts of that, the sort of creation of world orders of in our, uh, that this has had on society. But I also believe because Scotland was, although it's really struggling to engage with this history, um, it is also has an opportunity for those very same reasons to sort of drive the critical rethink within its kind of being forced within society to rethink its own acts of engagement in what and contributes uh, to its narrative, how it has used how that historically that history impacts still today on people who are racialized and that they could use the same power reach and influence in order to support the kind of cultural critical rethink that i is be, is being increased increasingly demanded by large sections of society and i feel in the collective stillness in the pandemic we were forced momentarily to sit in the interconnectedness of the inequity that we live within. And there has been an unprecedented determined focus on systemic racism, to name it, to try to understand what does that mean in practice? How has it contributed to shaping every aspect of our current world order from politics to law, to medicine, to art and philosophy? What does it look like and how is it maintained? So I, at the time of, um, when COVID first was impacting in 2020, March, 2020. So I was asked by a Scottish government because of some of the work. And as I say, I don't normally really work in equalities. I don't really, I, my research was very much with, I don't work directly with inequalities. But at this time, what was happening was 
in society in Scotland, we had no way of knowing because of our data whether what was being shown in England and in the rest of the UK and in other jurisdictions where predominantly white, uh, predominantly white countries where people are racialized, adversely racialized, we couldn't actually tell, despite the fact that we've been collecting levels of ethnicity data, we couldn't actually tell whether people were dying at a disparate or, or dying or unwell at a disproportionate rate in Scotland itself. So the there was a call from communities, there was a call from uh, academics, there was a call from uh, people to like what is happening. And I, I don't know if you remember the sort of intensity of that that moment that this that what what was and we couldn't tell in Scotland. And so there was an expert reference group was established by the Scottish government in order to have an understanding of the impact of COVID on minority ethnic communities and migrant communities in Scotland and what our policy responses should be to reflect on this. Um, in doing that, and so I, I agreed to, in my pandemic moment, to kind of accept uh, co-chairing and, and leading on that work and that was really um, well, it was a really difficult piece of work but there was a recognition which I had never seen before because of the COVID moment of a, a, an attempt to understand how racism and racialization impacts on people's health and lives in ways that systemically we had never I mean even using those words were like it was always problematic um within policy and government processes um, and there was always a lot of pushback um but society kind of took that on within it and so there was a call I mean I, I many people remember the enormous amounts of statements being put out by organizations about we're going to engage with systemic racism and we're going to look at that so I in that moment agreed to take on the role to help provide advice and recommendations to the Scottish government in relation to data to evidence and risk and systemic issues and so there were two kind of subgroups of which I was on both of the expert group. One was to review health data and evidence, and the other was to examine systemic issues and uh, risks. And although I always um, viewed both, I would review the health data and evidence as equally as a systemic issue, even though um, I lost the discussion to actually uh, keep them in the same paper, but they did actually uh, take forward two separate pieces of work. So the precautionary for the, one of the first things that happened was that the precautionary principle was applied. That was really looking at the, that was an acceptance by government through our COVID committee of which I submitted evidence to that if the impacts of COVID were manifesting in England and in other jurisdictions, in ways that indicate, even if we can't prove it by our data, we must act on the assumption that the systemic inequality that is creating the disproportionate risk of mortality and morbidity is likely to be happening in Scotland, even if we can't evidence it because our data is not um, able to tell us whether that is the case or not. So that was the first kind of thing <laughs> that, I, that I did in that role um, to, in order to take that forward. So just to kind of move forward a bit, there was then uh, a set of recommendations and sort of set into three. I'm not gonna go through them all. Um, the, the, there was recognition.